Hi everyone, this video covers a very important topic for life sciences, that is experimentation. This is applicable to science in general, but we will use it to explore life science ideas this year. So what is an experiment? Experiments are an essential part of the scientific process. They are preceded by observations and questions and hypotheses in the scientific method. For example, on any given day, you might make 100 observations about the living world around you. Unfortunately for a lot of people, the process stops here. If you are bold and curious enough, you might ask yourself some questions about what you see. Why is the grass green? Why do leaves change colors? These are some of the questions that would follow observations, um, some observations that you might make on a daily basis. The hypothesis then seeks to provide potential explanations for the questions you are asking. So some things about hypotheses. Uh, they are testable. So you should be able to perform an experiment to generate data about your hypothesis. They are also falsifiable. They need to be able to be shown to be wrong, uh, which disqualifies a lot of the questions that we ask. Some questions, you know, some philosophical questions or uh, religious questions, you might not be able to actually falsify. Um, so they wouldn't be able to fall under that scientific method. Um, they are often wrong. So hypotheses um, are often wrong, and um, this is okay. And an, an in incorrect hypothesis is valuable information about the living world around you. So experiments lead to data and information about your ideas. One can draw conclusions from the experimental data, but the process does not stop here. So you can see in this uh, slide here, if you go through and you form an exper uh, hypothesis, you perform the experiment, and you get some data, you collect the data, you analyze the data, and you draw some sort of conclusion, the process doesn't necessarily stop there. When experimental data does not support the hypothesis, a scientist will often go back and refine or change the hypothesis. We can see that line leading here. This is the back to the drawing board phase in science. And this is okay, by the way. Learning about the world around you is not as easy as some would show it to be. When the experimental data does support the hypothesis, the process still continues. Science is never a one and done endeavor. Experimental data should be replicable by you and others, and because of this, scientists often repeat experiments many times. So what are the essential parts of an experiment? There need to be variables that are manipulated for the purpose of the study. We call those the independent variables. So your experiment needs to include independent variables that can be manipulated. Um, these are the variables that we are studying, studying, and this is what the experimenter directly and purposefully manipulates. There are also variables that change in response to the independent variables. We call those dependent variables. And their change depends on the independent variable. The dependent variable is what we are measuring in most experiments. There must also be a control. The control is a part of the experiment that does not receive the independent variable. This allows us to see what happens when we do not change an aspect of the experimental environment. You've probably heard of controlled experiments, and this is why they are called that. They include a control for comparison of the, quote, experimental part of the experiment. It takes some time thinking uh, and creating great controls for our experiments, and we will practice this throughout the year and in, the, in a moment in this video. Lastly, all experiments need to include constants. These are aspects of the experiment that are the same in both the experimental and controlled portions of the experiment, and we will look at a few examples of these as well in this video. So here's an example of an experiment in biology. John is interested in the relationship between light intensity and photosynthesis rates in spinach. Okay, so note that this uh, experiment is based on the floating leaf disk lab, which we have not done this year, but I'll briefly explain it here for a moment. So John is predicting that leaf disks closer to the light will undergo more photosynthesis. He says that if you do this and move the cup closer, then the rates of photosynthesis will increase. Here is the experiment that John des designed. Okay, so we're, again, we're working with um, photosynthesis. He is curious about the rates of photosynthesis, so he's 
learned recently about photosynthesis, which is the process by which autotrophs convert solar energy into stored chemical energy. And he has a question about the relationship between the amount of solar energy, that is the light intensity, and how fast the rate of these photosynthesis reactions occur. Okay, so he's made a prediction. The prediction is shown there. He's made a hypothesis. The hypothesis is shown there. So now we have to um, design the experiment and see what we can get out of it, okay? So John designed the experiment. He cut out little disks of spinach and removed all the oxygen gas from them, leading to their sinking. You can see those sunken leaf disks down here at the bottom of these cups, well, the bottom of this cup. Okay, so when we start the experiment, the, the leaf disks will be at the bottom of the cup. Um, he's removed the oxygen gas from them, and what happens is, once photosynthesis um, starts to occur, the disks will rise. Um, if you're interested in the details of this protocol, which we will be using later in the year, you can watch this video here. Um, but for now, just suffice it to say that this is the starting point with the disks at the bottom. So if there is no photosynthesis, they stay on the bottom. If there is photosynthesis, then you'll slowly start to see them rise up off the bottom, okay? The speed at which they rise as a group over time describes their rate. So John is interested in seeing if increasing light intensity increases the rate at which they float. Okay, so here are some of the key elements of John's experiment. So uh, we're gonna set it up where the, the leaf disks start on the bottom. There is a light source. Everything that you need for photosynthesis to occur is shown here. Okay, the control will have its light placed at six inches. Okay, so this is gonna be our control experiment here. Uh, okay, so keep in mind that light intensity is the independent variable that John is studying. So John hypothesized that the cup with the greater light intensity uh, would photosynthesize better. So to increase intensity, what John has done is move this light bulb closer to the experimental subjects, to the um, leaf disks, okay? So this is the setup of the experiment. This is our experimental cup. This is our control cup because this is further away over here with six inches and the three inches over here is closer showing greater light intensity, okay? So we're gonna compare these two cups in this experiment. Let's review the constants for this experiment. So every experiment has constants that are um, the same in both the control and experimental part of the experiment, okay? so. Here, everything except light intensity should be the same for the two cups, okay? So if you were to go through and take the temperature of the cups, the temperature should be the same. If you were able to measure the humidity of the room, the humidity should be the same. You're using the same type of spinach, right? It's not like you're gonna allow one to be old and one to be, to be fresh. The light bulbs that are, that are being used are the same. So these are all the constants, okay, for this particular experiment. Okay, here is the data that John obtained from his experiment. Uh, this table shows the number of disks floating at any given time point. For example, when John looked at the cups after three minutes, there was one floating disk. So here at three minutes, we see that in the control cup there was one, and in the experimental cup there was two, and so on and so forth. The, the table shows all of this data here. Okay, so he observed the cups for 10 minutes and reported what he saw each minute. So each um, point here in the time shows at zero minutes start, one minute later, two minutes later, three minutes later, okay? Um, scientists create tables to organize and record their data, so you'll have to do a lot of that over the course of the year, and it's something you should really get comfortable with, okay? We should also get comfortable with the idea of visualizing our data. So John is gonna uh, visualize the data here uh, in order to share his findings with the community. So graphing is a really important part of science. You should be able to analyze uh, data. You should be able to construct graphical representations of your data. Creating and analyzing graphs will be an important component of this class. And it's really one of the top transferable skills in all of high school science. So when you go from biology to chemistry, chemistry to physics, 
perhaps physics back to biology with AP Biology, um, this is a skill that will transfer, transfer at every single level. Okay, so for this graph, you will need to focus on the X and Y axes shown here. Now, everything should be labeled logically in order to show what we're talking about. So first, we want to label um, each axis. Okay, so we've done that. For our experiment, the graph will show the number of plant disks that arose. So we're going to put that data over here on the Y axis. Um, Oftentimes, we display the dependent variable for our experiment on the y-axis. Uh, something to keep in mind as we go along. We were looking at these experiments over a 10-minute time period. So over here on the x-axis, we're going to um, plot um, the 10-minute time span in individual minutes across that x-axis. So note that numbering or scale of the axis is logical here. Given that there are only 10 minutes, you can write out 1 to 10 on this uh, axis. Um, you would not want to count out by tens or hundreds on this axis because then you wouldn't be able to visualize your data. So the scale needs to be appropriate for each of your graphs. In addition, when appropriate, the axis should label um, the units of measurement for what you are displaying, as we did here for time. Okay, so in this case, time is displayed in minutes here so that's a specific unit for that measurement on the x-axis the more information you can offer your reader the better okay so this shows the data for both the experimental and control parts of the experiment the experimental which is three inches away shown here uh, is in red and the control which is six inches away is shown here in black okay we know this because of the legend or key so if you look at this um, we can tell what color or what line shows what data because of this legend or key so you should always include a key for your reader so that they know what what data that they're looking at okay lastly it, it is always best practice to include a title for your graph this title summarizes your experiment. It can be uh, you know, as descriptive as you want it to be, but it should be descriptive. Um, I think it's best to describe the conclusion of your experiment, but at the very least, it should describe what you did experimentally. Here you can see that John investigated light intensity's effect on photosynthesis rates. Okay, um, So I will ask you to do this on all lab reports. I think it's a very good idea for all students out there. Include a title because it actually helps you in your mind to summarize what you did and what you found. Here are some examples of unhelpful titles. My graph, or group five data, or photosynthesis lab. None of those titles really tell me what happened or what you found. Again, help your reader understand your experiment uh, with a helpful title, okay? Scientists draw a conclusion from their data, even if they're planning on repeating the experiment several, several more times, you should be able to look at this graph and draw some sort of meaningful conclusion. You can see from this data that the higher light intensity created by moving the light closer to the disks results in faster rates of photosynthesis determined by the rate at which the disks float. So again, that red line that shows data when the light intensity is greater shows more disks floating at any given time point. So the rate for, the, for photosynthesis in that experiment is, is higher. Uh, scientists also use statistical tests to determine the level of error and significance of their data, but we haven't done that here. That's something that we'll do at some point during the year. Uh, but this is only an introduction to experimentation and analyzing graphs, constructing graphs. I hope this has helped you. Um, all biology classes will involve experimentation at some point, and you will be more successful in sharpening your scientific skills if you can design and analyze experiments from the start of the year. Okay, we'll see you next time.